welcome to District 86 Toastmasters Radio Show. Meet with fellow Toastmasters, learn secrets of public speaking and tips of leadership. We broadcast from Ontario, Canada. Follow us online at www.toastmasters86.org. I am Vitaly Fursov, District 86 Public Relations Officer and today's show host. Today our guest is Ryan Avery. 2012 champion of public speaking. Ryan com competed with over 30,000 people from 116 countries. Ryan, hi. Hi, how are you doing? Doing wonderful. Thank you for joining this uh, and thank you for dedicating time to talk to District 86 Toastmasters. Absolutely. I'm a big fan of District 86. I've been there a couple times and I hope to be back. So, Ryan, if you don't mind, I will be asking questions. Um, and obviously we want to know more about you. Tell us about okay. yourself. Where are you from? Where do you live? What do you do? I live in Portland, Oregon in the United States and I am a full-time speaker and trainer helping leaders improve their communication skills and be more successful. My wife and I we own two companies. Uh, one is a consulting company and one is dealing with keynotes and trainings and our products and we spoke 72 times last year and we're in different cities and this year we'll do about the same and it's a pretty fun job i can't lie <laughs> all right and uh, you're toastmaster since 2011 i am yeah okay i joined so, in 2011 and i'm still a toastmaster obviously you joined toastmasters and within a year you appeared on the international stage in orlando how did mm -hmm. this happen? When you joined Toastmasters, uh, did you already have in mind to to move to that, to progress to that level? Did you have in mind to come? No. Yeah, no, I joined Toastmasters because I used to say like every other word, like totally, like that's amazing, like I'm so excited, like, 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 and that was my filler words. And my dad, he told me I needed to join Toastmasters, and I said, isn't that for older people? And he goes, no. Um, and I go, well, I can't afford it right now. And he goes, no worries, I'll pay for it. And I was like, dang it. Uh, so <laughs> he he paid for my he paid for my dues. I I went on my first speech. I said 44 ums in my first speech, and realized I also had an um and like problem. And just a couple weeks later, I was watching a couple YouTube videos of this guy going for the world championship of public speaking, and I said, I can do that. And I, I ran outside of my bedroom. I said, Babe, to my wife, I said, Babe, I'm going to be the world champion of public speaking this year. And she looked at me and she goes, that's a real thing? And um, eight months later, you know, I, she, I said, well, or not eight months later, I, right then I said, look, I'm, I really want to do this. Can you help me? And she said, yes. And then eight months later, we, we won the world championship. Is your wife a master as well? My wife is a postmaster as well. We actually made a bet during the training that if I won the world championship, she'd have to join. So <laughs> it was a win-win-win for everybody. <laughs> you really wanted her yeah. to join. Are you a member of a single club or multiple clubs? Tell us about your clubs. I am part of two clubs. Um, I have my original club, Club 31, the one that I joined, and then the one that I started called Competitive Speakers. And our goal in Competitive Speakers Portland is to improve the quality and quantity of competitive speaking at all levels, and then to start a competitive speakers club in every district around the world. And in the past year so far, we have started five competitive speakers clubs around the world, two in Arizona, one in Oregon, one in California, and one in India. And we would love to have one in District 86 as well. So... <laughs> Anybody who's listening wants to start a competitive speakers club, let us know. We'll be happy to help you get it started. What is a competitive speakers club? Tell, tell a little bit more, please. Yeah, we focus on improving the quality and quantity of competitive speakers. And what we do in that club is we don't do the general evaluation that's given to us by the Toastmaster manual. We do that outside of the club. So someone there is doing that so we still get credit and the speaker still gets credit. But instead of taking two and a half minutes for a normal evaluation, we actually take 10 minutes round robin. One can give feedback, but the feedback is based off of the judge's form. 
does speech development, content, grammar, vocal variety, how well did you use the stage? And we provide specifics for that speaker on how they can improve based on the judges' form. So we have uh, three speakers and then 10 minutes of uh, round-robin evaluation based off the speaker's form. And then each season, there's um, either table topics or there is evaluations, um, which we also provide feedback as well for, for those. And it's, it's awesome. We've, we just chartered last month, and it's been an exciting journey so far to get that started. We've been doing it here for about four or five months, chartered last month, and now we're growing an already into five different uh, clubs around the world. Very interesting, very interesting format. Thank you for sharing. And I am sure there will be uh, multiple calls to you in regards of uh, competitive speaking clubs. I, I'm sure the yes, 86 would be interested. Yeah, thank you. Now, Brian, uh, when, mm -hmm. uh, uh, when, when you were uh, competing on international level, I know you, mm -hmm. you need to bring minimum two speeches uh, to the international stage. What speeches have you brought there? My two speeches, my first one that took me through semifinals was called Push Past It. And it's a speech about pushing past your fears and those things in life that you need to get through. And my world championship speech is called Trust is a Must. And it's about trust is the most important part of any relationship. Um, how, how did you come up with ideas of those speeches? Where, um, in, in general, when, when you're looking for a topic for your speech, where are you looking uh, yeah, that's for? That's a good question. Well, the speech originally was called Just Jump, and it was about me doing my adventurous things in life, and it was about me just uh, struggling with a lot of things. And I was talking to my grandma about it because I had given it, and I thought I wrote this great speech, and I went and delivered it to a Toastmaster group, and nobody laughed. People did not like it. And, I was like, man, this is, this is a bummer. What am I going to do? And I was talking to my grandmother, and she said, push past it. And that's advice that she's given me in the past. And I realized, okay, that's a great message. I can send my grandmother's message of push past it. Um, and then with trust is a must, it actually took me 26 different versions of trust is a must to get to the final speech. And I had a lot of speeches before that uh, that I had written and developed that it transformed into trust as a must. So it originally was called There's Hope for Your Generation, You Have to Go to Grow, uh, Light It on Fire, Promise Me, and then Trust as a Must. So there were a lot of a lot of different versions to get to trust as a must. It was a variety of things. Um, my mentor, Randy Harvey, the 2004 World Champion of Public Speaking, my coach, Chelsea, which is also, who's also my wife, and then my friends and family in District 7 who really helped me, and I got to go to different clubs and get feedback. I received over a 1,000 evaluations throughout my training, so um, I couldn't have done it without District 7, Randy, Chelsea, my friends and family. I know recently you published a book. Uh, tell mm -hmm. us about your experience of uh, writing a book and just go ahead and advertise your book. So yeah, you I would recommend about. anyone who's looking to buy is, A, it puts a deadline on you. B, it strengthens the book because I am now a better writer because of my co-author. So I co-wrote this book with best-selling author Jeremy Donovan, and he really taught me a lot about writing and, and upped my writing to, to a new level. Um, we also, also uh, you get to double the marketing you, and your reach. And yeah, you just you get pushed to um, meet your deadlines and produce a quality product. So I would really recommend co-authoring your first book. Our book is called Speaker, Leader, Champion, Succeed at Work Through the Power of Public Speaking. What Jeremy and I did is we dissected 12 world champion speakers and provided the reader with 92 tips how to advance professional career. Not professional speaking career, but professional career. You can do now in the company or organization that you're with and how you can improve your speaking skills so you can get that promotion that you want. So you can go out and land that new client. So you can be a better speaker to turn into a more influential leader. I also know you have an audio book narrated, right? Yep. So the ebook is available. It's published in ebook on 
and video version as well. And it's on Amazon. It's in your local bookstores. Most likely it's Barnes & Noble. You can get it anywhere. It's called Speaker and Leader Champion. I, uh, yeah, I just downloaded the audio version. I just got it like two weeks ago, and it's really neat to, to hear. Um, they hired a professional to to do the audio, and he did a great job. And um, it's helping people learn how to be best speakers and advance in their career. It's been t- translated now into four different languages, and it's selling around the world, which is really exciting. Outside of Toastmasters, um, who mm-hmm. Ryan Avery is? Tell us about you outside of Toastmasters. Do you have hobbies? Yes. But, uh, I would say outside of Toastmasters, my hobbies are anything to do with adventure. I love adventure. I love traveling. I like reading and blogging and spending any time. I'm going to say 95% of my life I'm spending with my wife. So if I can spend time with my wife, that's the the best of the best. So my hobbies would be adventure, travel, reading, blogging, spending time with friends and family and my wife. Ryan, I also know that uh, it was time in your life when you had just $84 on your account. And at that moment, you have decided to donate $8.40. Can you please tell us about that time and what caused you to make that decision? Yeah, so about four years ago, Chelsea and I were broke. Uh, We had $84 in our bank account, didn't know how we were going to pay rent or even pay for food. And after 75 job applications, I finally landed a job and they paid me in advance so I could pay for rent. And Chelsea and I, my wife, we never wanted to be back in that situation again. And we wanted and talked about what it means to be successful. Identified four things that we needed to feel successful because for us, success isn't a destination. It's how it's a feeling. So we decided that um, we always have to live, give, invest, and travel. And if we do those four things every day or throughout our life, we will consider it to be success. And so what we did is we decided to give 10% of our money away to good causes. Uh, We decided to put 10% of our money into a travel account, and we put uh, 25% into savings and then lived off of 55. Those are a little change now that we started a business, but the one that has stayed consistent is giving 10% of our income away. So for the past four years, Chelsea and I have given 10% of what we make to good causes, and I remember being uh, when we made made that rule and we had an eighty-four dollars. I said, look, we we have to set eight dollars and forty cents aside, or else we're never going to do this. And it was really tough, um, but we did it. And I, I have to tell you that the second we started that, our life changed forever because we believe when you give more, you get more. And uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to see more people give. Uh, in the United States, the average American gives 2% of their income away. Think how different our world would be if everybody gave 10%. It, it, would, it would change the world. It would change everybody's perspective on things, and we've had so much more if we gave just a little more. So I'm, you know, I, I'll do that for the rest of my life and hopefully try to convince more people to give 10% of their income away. Amazing. What is your uh, favorite charity? We have a variety of ones that we support on a regular basis, from Special Olympics to Wounded Warriors to Girls, Inc., and to HIV and AIDS Awareness. Those would be our four big ones. And then, you know, we do random things where we, we're in the grocery store and we'll buy people's groceries uh, right behind us. You can just tell it might be a single mom and she's got three kids and she just dumps a whole bunch of groceries on the, the counter and Chelsea and I say, hey, uh, we'll buy your groceries today. And they're like, yeah, right. <laughs> and we go, no, seriously, we'll buy it. And, uh, they, that, that feeling, you can't get a better feeling than that. Um, so something like that or donating to a good cause or doing a 5K run or you know, there's little things that we do here and there besides the big ones that we support. Amazing. 